Good morning, um, this is Lori Barton. I am going to continue our talks on obstetric anesthesia. Today we're gonna to be talking about the anesthetic implications of obstetric complications, including preterm labor, multiple gestation, malpresentation, cord prolapse, and embolic disorders. Let's just talk about preterm labor and delivery. <clears throat> in 2006, 12.8% of US births were preterm, with 3.6% being before 34 weeks gestation. Starting in the 20th century, we started to see a rise in the number of premature births that were due to multiple gestation pregnancies. Approximately 50% of twins and 90% of triplets are born preterm, compared to less than 10% of singleton pregnancies. Birth weight can also be used to define prematurity. Low birth weight is defined as less than 2,500 grams, and very low birth weight is defined as less than 1,500 grams, and extremely low birth weight is less than 1,000 grams. So it's really important to understand that it is extremely rare to be able to completely arrest preterm labor our goal when we think about preterm labor delay is just to delay. We're not going to be able to stop it. Ideally, a course of tocolytics can delay a delivery for at least 48 hours so that maternal corticosteroids can be administered, thus allowing for increased fetal lung maturity. Premature infants exposed to antenatal gl glucocorticoids have less incidence of um, neck, they have less respiratory distress syndrome, and they have less uh, intraventricular hemorrhage. They also suffer from decreased mortality as compared to those that have not had the exposure to steroids for at least 48 hours. Since there's really little evidence to support steroids after 34 weeks gestation, um, the National Institute of Health has recommended not using steroid therapy in preterm deliveries that are greater than 34 weeks gestation unless there's evidence of fetal lung uh, immaturity. So <clears throat> we think about two different regimens. One is betamethasone, and you give two doses, 12 milligrams IV, 24 hours apart, or dexamethasone, four doses of six milligrams IM, 12 hours apart. Another goal in is um, in our group B strep positive mothers, and you wanna be able to have delivery of antibiotic therapy prior to needle, natal uh, GBS infection. So being able to deliver steroids as well as uh, delivering antibiotic therapy can help in these proturients. An additional consideration of tocolytic therapy is the time that it allows for transfer of the parturient to a facility that's going to be able to be prepared to deal with premature neonate with NICU facilities as well as neonatologists. <clears throat> so you have to think about the considerations um, with maternal steroid administration. You're going to have transient decreases in fetal heart rate variability, um, decreased fetal movement and breathing, transient maternal hyperglycemia, um, but realize that the steroid effect of hyperglycemia begins about 12 hours after the initial dose and can last up to five days afterwards. So knowing that the um, fetus is gonna have these um, changes, you really wanna consider that um, and it's gonna result in a lower biophysical profile score or a non-reactive stress test in these, in these uh, fetuses. So as we stated earlier, tocolytic therapy aims to delay delivery, usually for the administration of antenatal steroids or transfer of maternal care to a more specialized facility. Contraindications to tocolytic therapy is gonna include chorioamnionitis, non-reassuring fetal status, severe fetal growth restriction, severe preeclampsia, maternal hemorrhage with hemodynamic instability, as well as lethal fetal anomalies and intrauterine fetal demise. So let's talk a little bit about magnesium sulfate. <clears throat> magnesium can reduce a patient's blood pressure, however, this does not cause a decrease in uterine blood flow. Although neuraxial anesthesia is not contraindicated in patients receiving magnesium therapy, if general anesthesia is needed, there are a few things to consider. First, magnesium is going to potentiate the neuromuscular blockade that's induced by non-depolarizing neuromuscular blockers. 
um, it also might antagonize the block that's going to be produced by succinylcholine. Despite these findings, there is no evidence to support changing the intubating dose for general anesthesia in perpetrants receiving magnesium, either for tocolysis, fetal neuroprotection, or for eclamptic um, prophylaxis. However, in patients receiving magnesium therapy, there is a decrease in the maintenance dose of non-depolarizing muscle relaxants, and this should be titrated with a nerve stimulator in patients that need continued muscle relaxation after intubation. So if you think about your therapeutic dose, we've got a really narrow window with magnesium being five to seven milligrams per deciliter. It doesn't take a whole lot to start seeing loss of patellar reflexes, a little bit more to have feelings of flushing, uh, somnolence, slurred speech, muscle paralysis, respiratory difficulty, and then finally cardiac arrest. So realize it that your patient has um, very tight windows um, for therapeutic management. Um, patients should have um, magnesium checks continually while they're on this medication. <clears throat> So let's talk a little bit about um, beta adrenergic receptor agonists. Most common in the United States is terbutaline. It can be administered IV, sub-Q, or orally. Um, it is 60 times more selective for beta-2 receptors as compared to beta-1 receptors. Pulmonary edema during the use of terbutaline is thought to be a result of fluid overload and increased pulmonary capillary permeability. Fluid retention from beta adrenergic stimulation causing increased renin and antidiuretic hormone therapy. Um, you do get a uh, concomitant stimulation of beta 1 receptors causing maternal side effects, including tachycardia, cardiac dysrhythmias, palpitations, myocardial ischemia, chest pain, shortness of breath, pulmonary edema, tremor, anxiety, and restlessness. Um, they can also have nausea and vomiting, rash hypokalemia because you're removing potassium intracellularly from the extracellular space, and hyperglycemia. Fetal effects of terbutaline include tachycardia, hypotension, ileus, hyperinsulinemia, and hypoglycemia. Anesthetic considerations with patients on terbutaline therapy include concern of further hypotension with initiation of neuroxial anesthesia or induction of general anesthesia. Phenylephrine, an alpha-1 adrenergic agonist, is a good option since it's not only going to counter the decreased systemic vascular resistance of the terbutaline, but it's also going to allow for a reflex bradycardia, which is especially beneficial in patients with terbutaline-induced tachycardia. But caution should be taken with given fluids um, if you're trying to address your hypotension with volume since the patient will be prone to pulmonary edema. Remember, we have leaky capillaries um, in the pulmonary vasculature. Further clouding the picture occurs when the patients on tributylene therapy have general anesthesia. Uh, tachycardia might mislead you to believing that the patient might be under light anesthesia or that the tachycardia might obscure the picture when trying to clinically assess the effects of maternal blood loss. You have to have close observation of the surgical field and the suction canister, and that's going to help differentiate between tachycardia related to tributylene versus tachycardia related to maternal hemorrhage. Also be aware of hyperventilation in general anesthesia since the respiratory alkalosis associated with hyperventilation can cur further cause hypokalemia by pushing the potassium into the intracellular space. <clears throat> so ch calcium channel blockers. Um, maternal side effects of these are going to include nausea, flushing, headache, vertigo, palpitations, you also see peripheral vasodilation with resulting decrease in mean arterial pressure. You're also going to see an activation of sympathetic activity with manifestations of maternal tachycardia. These changes are usually less severe um, than those that you see with terbutaline, but just be aware of them. Um, anesthetic implications for patients on calcium channel blockers include um, just be cautious with your inhalational agents um, since they can do they can depress maternal myocardial contractility and cardiac uh, conduction. In cases of postpartum hemorrhage, oxytocin and 15-methyl prostaglandin F2-alpha may not be as effective um, in patients who are on calcium channel blockers, so you're going to see an increased risk of uterine acne in these patients. <coughs> Excuse me. 
let's move on to cyclooxygenase inhibitors of note. Um, they usually were those cyclooxygenase inhibitors resulted in fewer births between 37 weeks gestation as well as an increase in gestational age and birth weight. Therefore, it's become the first line therapy for preterm labor before 32 weeks. Maternal side effects, however, include nausea, esophageal reflux, gastritis, uh, maternal interstitial nephritis and platelet dysfunction might also occur, so be aware of that if you're thinking of neuraxial anesthesia. However, according to the third consensus conference on neuraxial anesthesia and anticoagulation sponsored by ASRA, they do not increase the risk of spinal or epidural hematoma. The primary fetal concerns are constriction of the ductus arteriosus and oligohydramnios. Maternal contraindications include platelet dysfunction, bleeding disorders, hepatic dysfunction, GI ulcerative disease, renal dysfunction, and asthma in women with hypersensitivity to aspirin. So let's move on to multiple gestation pregnancies. Um, an important factor in the pregnancy is the configuration of the placenta in multiple gestations. They may be either monochorionic, dichorionic, and the amniotic and the amniotic sac in monochorionic and di twins might be either monoamniotic or diamniotic. <clears throat> in multiple gestation, the risk of hemorrhage increases in both the antepartum as well as the postpartum period. The rate of placental abruption increases by two to three times as compared to singleton pregnancies. Placenta previa is 40% more common in twin gestation, and uterine atony is more common, thus leading to greater postpartum blood loss. This is a result of the increased uterine distension. Also increased is the risk of surgical intervention. Up to 75% of multiple gestation pregnancies have either a cesarean section or an operative vaginal delivery. For most um, uh, twins in the vertex-vertex position, the delivery is usually vaginal unless there are other contraindications. If the first twin is not vertex, then cesarean delivery is usually followed. If twin A is vertex and twin B is not, there's more ambiguity with multiple options, and this is usually going to be dependent on the obstetrician and his or her level of comfort. For most triple, de triplet deliveries or higher number of gestation deliveries, cesarean section is the standard. However, for twin gestations, um, like I said, delivery is far less uniform. Um, in twin deliveries, <clears throat> excuse me, um, whenever twin A is vertex and twin B is not, you've got some options. You can have a trial of ECV on twin B, and if successful, then continue on to vaginal delivery. Um, uh, and then finally, cesarean delivery. Anesthetic management in multiple gestation. Um, obviously, neuraxil is going to be a method of choice. Um, early on, you've got to consider having this in um, and uh, uh, think about having whether... Sorry, let me start that again. Um, a while back, neuraxial was actually um, contraindicated in multiple gestations, um, but they were able to show that um, you do have an increased umbilical pH and a lower rate of cesarean section for the second twin if neuraxial anesthesia is employed. Um, you also have to think about the concern that there's an increased abdominal pressure from multiple gestation and venous engorgement can cause further cephalate spread of the intrathecal local anesthetic, thus causing a higher neuraxial block. Um, two studies that have looked into this show conflicting results with the height of the block based on multiple gestations. However, both studies showed similar effects of hypotension and the dosage of vasopressors that were used to correct the hypotension. So, um, although there's conflicting evidence, I think it's just important to look at this on a case-by-case -case basis and be prepared for a higher spread as well as um, needing uh, resuscitation for the sympathectomy that results. At the University of Kentucky, all of our twin deliveries are done in the labor and delivery operative suite, despite the type of delivery, whether it's going to be vaginal versus cesarean delivery. In these cases, being in the OR allows for emergent conversion to cesarean section in cases of fetal bradycardia or umbilical cord prolapse. <clears throat> 
So moving on to malpresentation, this complicates about 4% of pregnancy. Um, prior to 28 weeks, as many as 40% of fetuses are in the breech position. However, most convert to vertex by delivery. Um, and there's variable types of breech presentation. So frank breech is the buttocks presenting with legs flexed at the hips and extended at the knees. Complete breech is going to be buttocks presenting with legs flexed at the hips and knees. Footlong breech is one or both feet presenting with hips and knees extended. And kneeling breech is one or both knees presenting with hips extended and knees flexed. Uh, currently, 80 to 90% of breech deliveries occur by cesarean section. ACOG states that vaginal breech delivery may be reasonable in appropriately screened patients. Despite the statement from ACOG, uh, remember most are going to plan for cesarean section. <coughs> so complications of vaginal breech delivery, um, obviously thinking about umbilical cord prolapse, the incidence can be as high as 28% uh, percent and have an associated neonatal mortality as high as 38%. Conditions associated with a higher incidence of cord prolapse are going to include footling or a complete breach, a small fetus, or a multiparity. When umbilical cord prolapse occurs, emergency C-section is required to avoid neonatal asphyxia or death. Um, fetal head entrapment is a more concern prior to 32 weeks gestation. Um, it's due to the fact that the fetal head is generally larger than the area created by the buttocks and the thighs at its early gestational age. Um, Drusions incisions um, made in the cervix at the 2, 6, and 10 o'clock positions um, can help increase the size of the passage. Um, however, um, it's related to significant hemorrhage, which might be concealed in the vaginal vault or pelvic cavity. And then um, thinking about emergency cesarean uh, delivery, the Zavanelli maneuver involves the obstetrician to attempting to return the fetal head and body into the uterus and performing an emergency cesarean section. This is done when the um, fetus has uh, become entrapped. Um, although it can be successful and can have um, devastating consequences, including fetal anoxia, uterine rupture and cervical spine dislocation and clavicular and humeral fractures. <clears throat> Cesarean breech delivery is most commonly um, performed as compared to vaginal breech delivery, um, as we stated, um, although ACOG said that vaginal breech can be attempted, um, as we have learned, most oftentimes these are done under cesarean delivery. Of note, uterine relaxation can be accomplished with nitroglycerin, um, uh, about 50 to 100 micrograms. If the patient is having the procedure under general anesthesia, um, increasing the inhalational agent to greater than one mat can also facilitate uterine relaxation. However, the quick reversal that is available with nitroglycerin makes it a much more attractive option given the need for uterine contraction following the delivery of the neonate. So let's talk a little bit about external cephalic version or ECV. Um, anesthesia for ECV must be weighed against the relative risk during this procedure. Um, in communicating with the obstetrician, the patient and the anesthesiologist provides um, direction for anesthesia to be involved or not to be involved. Um, even if no norexial anesthesia is used for the procedure, the anesthesiologist should have a good understanding of the patient with an HMP and physical exam prior to any ECV attempt. Risks to the fetus and the parturion from ECV include fetal bradycardia, placental abruption, fetal maternal transfusion syndrome, uh, uterine rupture, vaginal bleeding, umbilical cord prolapse, fetal femur fracture, cervical cord transection, intracranial hemorrhage, and fetal death. Many obstetricians believe that maternal pain is an important um, uh, clue for them to limit the amount of force that they're going to apply because of concerns specifically about placental abruption or uterine um, rupture. In these cases, they may choose to avoid neuraxial placement. It's important to recognize the benefits as well as the risks in these uh, types of situations. In patients that have had neuraxial um, placement prior to ECV, the success rate though is gonna be higher. Also having a working epidural catheter that can be quickly dosed for an emergency cesarean section if injury to the mother or fetus during an ECV helps prevent um, the risk of difficult intubation or aspiration that are always of concern in this um, patient population. 
So let's move on to embolic complications during pregnancy. Specifically, we're going to be talking about pulmonary thromboembolism, venous air embolism, and amniotic fluid embolism. <clears throat> These represent the most common cause of direct maternal mortality in the Western world. Um, specifically, pulmonary thromboembolism, 0.01 to 0.05% of all pregnancies um, are going to be complicated by some type of pulmonary thromboembolism. Most common is due to a DVT. So although DVT is most common, be aware that superficial vein thrombosis occurs in the antepartum period in as many as 0.15% of pregnancies. They can also occur from purpural septic vein and purpural ovarian vein thrombosis. Half of the cases of thromboembolism in women of childbearing age occur during pregnancy or during the purpurium. So realize that this is a very high risk population. Um, DVT has decreased recently due to the increased ambulation efforts um, during the postpartum period. I think the increased um, awareness by our obstetricians as well as our anesthesiologists has helped make this number come down. But think about venous stasis. You get an enormous increase in the size of the uterus. At term, the uterine blood flow increases to 700 uh, to 900 mils per minute which is about 10 to 12% of your maternal cardiac output. So a gravid uterus compresses the IVC and you really get a resultant venous stasis. Also during pregnancy, you get changes in coagulation. Um, you get enhanced platelet turnover, um, enhanced coagulation, as well as fibrinolysis. You see an increase in coagulation factors 1, 5, 7, 9, 10, as well as 12. You also see an increase in thrombin generation. Important to note is that during the first 48 hours after delivery, fibrinolytic activity decreases. Coagulation activity does not seem the same decrease, so therefore this mismatch or imbalance can contribute to increased risk of pulmonary thromboembolism. Finally, you get vascular damage. In vaginal deliveries and with the separation of the placenta, there is vascular trauma, which leads to accelerated um, coagulation activity. Cesarean delivery further causes vascular trauma and continues to increase the risk for thromboembolism. The risk of both DVT and pulmonary thromboembolism are much higher, um, about eight times higher after cesarean delivery than after vaginal delivery. So really think about these patients after they've come out of the OR. And finally, this risk is also increased by obstetric complications related to preeclampsia as well as multiple gestation. <clears throat> So diagnosis of pulmonary thromboembolism, um, start thinking about your clinical signs, dyspnea, palpitations, anxiety, chest pain, which may be pleuritic. The patient may become cyanotic, diaphoretic, and might have a cough. On your physical exam, think about tachypnea, crackles, decreased breath sounds, and tachycardia. Signs of DVT, calf or thigh edema, erythema, tenderness, and as well as a palpable cord. On EKG, I want you to think about signs of right heart failure. Um, RV um, strain, right axis shift, P pulmonal, ST, uh, T segment abnormalities, T wave inversion. Also on your physical exam, think about those signs of right heart failure. Listen for a split second heart sound, jugular venous distension, as well as hepatic engorgement. So your diagnostic tests for pulmonary thromboembolism. Um, obviously, you always think about D-dimer. With a negative result, the probability of embolus is probably less than 2% in a non-pregnant patient, and really is no further testing that's required. However, in a positive test, it's not specific for pulmonary thromboembolism, especially in a pregnant patient. D-dimers are detectable during the second trimester and continue to rise in normal pregnancies, returning to baseline by about six weeks postpartum. So it's really not going to be your ideal test. Lower extremity venous ultrasound um, is optimal in that it has no radiation exposure. However, false negative results might be as high as 10%. Um, you can get a chest x-ray. You might see some atelectasis, pleural effusion, elevated hemidiaphragm, segmental infiltrates. However, chest x-rays are neither sensitive nor specific for pulmonary thromboembolism, and you're going to be exposing um, the mother and fetus to radiation without necessarily getting a good diagnosis. VQ scans are common, efficient, and safe in pregnant patients, and if it's normal, pulmonary thromboembolism can be excluded. If there is high clinical suspicion of pulmonary thromboembolism and the VQ scan indicates a high probability, then there are no more tests needed, and you can go ahead and give a diagnosis of PTE, and you can begin anticoagulation therapy immediately. 
spiral CT is done though if there's high clinical suspicion and the BP scan is indeterminate. If it's extremely, um, or a spiral CT is extremely sensitive and specific, in both the BP scan and the spiral CT, they can be modified to decrease the amount of radiation exposure, which is of um, significance in this pregnant population. Although judicious use of radiation exposure during pregnancy is wise, small amounts of radiation exposure uh, most likely increase the fetal risk to a very limited extent. And if you're very concerned about um, pulmonary thromboembolism, the risks of radiation exposure under a spiral CT are going to be far less significant than a non-diagnosed PTE. <coughs> So recall that heparin is going to work by binding to antithrombin 3, and when bound to antithrombin 2, antithrombin 3 accelerates its action on deactivating thrombin, or factor 2A, factor 10A, and factor 9A. Heparin dose requirements um, up, are going to be increased up to 50% higher in the second and third trimester, and they might be higher in pregnancy due to increased coagulation factors that accompany pregnancy. The level of anticoagulation is evaluated with a PTT, which should be kept at 1.5 to 2 times the normal range. IV therapy is continued for 5 to 7 days with the transition to subcutaneous heparin. Heparin therapy is discontinued when active labor begins and ideally for 24 hours before cesarean section. Postpartum, the patient can restart heparin therapy after the patient is stable and hemostasis is obtained. Warfarin is started concurrently and is monitored by INR with a goal INR of being two to three. Once that's achieved, heparin is then DC'd, and warfarin be can be used with breastfeeding, and then the anticoagulation is going to be continued for at least six weeks postpartum. Um, low molecular weight heparin affects antithrombotic activity, so anti-factor 10A, rather than the anticoagulant activity of 2A. Therefore, its effect is not going to be measured by a PTT. The benefits of low molecular weight heparin, um, there's a decreased incidence of HIT, there's going to be less bleeding disorders, there's going to be a decreased risk of osteoporosis with low molecular weight heparin as compared to regular heparin. <clears throat> so insertion of an epidural needle causes some bleeding into the epidural space in 10% of healthy patients. The risk of hematoma seems to be increased by traumatic or repeated spinal or epidural punctures. So when thinking about these in patients who are going to be anticoagulated, you really want to follow your ASWR guidelines and always make sure you're thinking about those guidelines when placing an epidural, removing an epidural, or restarting your dosing of your anticoagulation after the epidural has been removed or after it's been placed. Let's move on to venous air embolism. Um, it's common occurrence regardless of the method of delivery, either vaginal or cesarean, and regardless of the type of anesthetic, general versus neuraxial. Um, left uterine displacement and the use of Trendelenburg increases the risk of venous air embolism. It's important to note that pressure gradient as small as negative 5 centimeters of water between the surgical field and the heart allows for a significant amount of air to be entrained into the venous circulation. Um, studies with patients um, having cesarean sections have a wide range of incidence between 67% and 97%. So realize that most of your cesarean deliveries are going to have some type of venous air embolism. It's just most of the time obviously not going to be clinically significant. Precordial Doppler can detect volumes as small as 0.1 mils of air. So if you've got a precordial Doppler placed, you should be able to hear that um, murmur if, with as little as 0.1 mils of air. Morbidity and mortality from venous air embolism are related to the volume and the rate of infusion of air into the central circulation, as well as the site of the embolization. Large volumes, meaning greater than 3 mils per kilogram of, of patient weight um, of air, are fatal, probably due to an airlock. So this is going to be a mechanical lock obstructing blood flow. Smaller amounts can result in VQ mismatch, hypoxemia, right heart failure, arrhythmias, and hypotension. Paradoxical embolism can lead to cardiovascular and neurologic injury as well. <clears throat> so venous air embolism um, presentation is not going to be very specific. It can be some dramatic event with hypotension, hypoxemia, and cardiac arrest. Typically, it's far less dramatic with chest pain, decreased saturation, and dyspnea. EKG changes include ST depression and are, are seen in about 25 to 
25 to 50 percent of all patients undergoing cesarean section. So even though they might not have that dramatic cardiovascular collapse, hypotension, hypoxemia, and cardiac arrest, realize that 25 to 50 percent of all patients undergoing cesarean section are going to manifest with ST depression, um, and you're just going to want to be aware of that. And no um, um, management is going to change at that point unless they develop that. Uh, clinical signs of hypotension, hypoxemia, and cardiac arrest. If those occur, um, you want to have resuscitation <coughs> by thinking about um, preventing further air entrapment. So that's going to rely on you having good communications with your surgeons, flooding the field with um, um, crystalloid. You want to discontinue your nitrous oxide and give 100% oxygen. Um, you want to have supportive ventilation, um, support the circulation, Consider a multi-orifice catheter to attempt air aspiration. Um, you want to expedite delivery of the uh, neonate. If you have delayed emergence, you want to consider neurodiagnostic imaging um, afterward. Patients with evidence of paradoxical cerebral um, arterial gas embolism might benefit from hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So if your facility has that like we do here at UK, um, you want to be in, in uh, considering that early on. So let's move on to amniotic fluid embolism. The incidence is very broad, specifically because um, we don't know exactly how to define amniotic fluid, and fluid embolism. Most commonly we report somewhere between four to six per 100,000 live births in the United States. Mortality is also broad and it's reported between 25% and 80%. The presence of meconium in the amniotic fluid was associated with a uniformly dismal prognosis with no survivors having escaped neurologic insult. Um, they can occur in the first trimester during procedures such as abortion, during the second trimester, after abdominal trauma, and in the postpartum period. So realize that this is not exclusive to a patient who is um, in active labor. It can happen during any time of the pregnancy. Um, and realize that um, amniotic fluid embolism is truly a diagnosis of exclusion. So um, because of that, um, we have a very broad definition of what an amniotic fluid embolism is and realize that um, if you don't have something that is, is um, falling under anything else, realize that AFD has to be included in your differential. Um, in talking about laboring patients, two-thirds of amniotic um, uh, fluid embolisms occurred within the first five hours of delivery. Um, of the survivors in the United States, um, only 25% of the 12 cases that were studied in one particular um, study were deemed neurologically intact. So it has a very, very high um, risk of morbidity as well as mortality. So when you think of amniotic fluid embolism, it's really um, classically broken down into a biphasic response. However, realize that all, not all amniotic fluid embolism um, is going to have a biphasic response, but classically we think about it as having two phases. The first phase being a transient pulmonary vasospasm, and this is probably due to release of vasoactive substances. So you're going to see right heart failure and right heart strain. You're going to see, if you do a transesophageal echo, you're going to see um, <clears throat> right heart failure with a um, bowed septum. Um, you're going to have low cardiac output leading to VQ mismatch, hypoxemia, and hypotension, and this is going to last less than 30 minutes. If the patient is able to survive, because most of the time this phase one is um, uh, fatal, then you're often going to have a move into phase two, which shows left ventricular failure, failure and pulmonary edema um, if they are able to survive that initial insult. <coughs> Like I said, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. And you want to think about um, other things such as PTEs, unit air embolism, septic shock, MIs, anaphylaxis. You can think of anesthetic complications such as total spinals. Um, they can also mask themselves as AFVs or systemic local um, anesthetic uh, toxicity or LAST. Um, other obstetric complications can also cloud the picture such as placental abruption and eclampsia but you really want to remember your clinical presentation can include hypotension, fetal compromise, pulmonary edema, cardiopulmonary arrest, cyanosis, coagulopathy, dyspnea, seizures, atony, bronchospasm, transient hypertension, cough, headache, as well as chest pain. So management of your amniotic fluid embolism, you want to initiate CPR as 
as soon as possible. Once you have cardiovascular collapse, you want to support the maternal circulation following all ACLS guidelines. You want to have IV resuscitation using large gauge um, peripheral IVs, A-line, central line with PA catheter, inotropes if needed, fetal monitoring and making decisions with obstetricians on how soon you want to have delivery, treat coagulopathy and manage the sequela of shock. <clears throat> Intact maternal survival after cardiac arrest is rare, and delivery may, on theoretical grounds, actually be a benefit to the mother undergoing CPR. Therefore, in patients with amniotic fluid embolism, it's recommended that C-section be started immediately after maternal cardiac arrest. Also realize that um, in these patients, if you are doing CPR on these patients, you want to continue good chest compression, but you also want to have somebody until they're able to deliver the neonate and prep for C-section. Um, have somebody lifting the fetus off so that you avoid butyl cable compression and you're able to get good blood return during that cardiovascular collapse. Um, that's going to conclude today's podcast. Uh, please don't hesitate to stop and ask me questions if you see me or email me. I'm more than happy to answer any confusion that I might have caused or clarify anything. Thank you and have a great day.